война, если враг нападет, если темная сила нагрянет, как один человек, весь советский народ на свободную родину встанет, на земле в небесах и на море, на стопелки могучий слов, если завтра война, если завтра поход, будь сегодня поход. Летит самолет, настрочит пулемет, Нагрохочут железные танки. И линкоры пойдут, и пехота пойдет, И подчат на легкие тачанки. На земле в небесах и на море, На стопелки могучих слов. Если завтра война, если завтра поход, Будь сегодня к походу готов. Поднимайся, народ, собирайся в поход, барабаны сильней, барабанься. Пулты толпы вперед, забивалы вперед, нашу песню победою гляньте. На земле в небесах и на море, на стопелки покушки суров. Если завтра война, если завтра поход, будь сегодня в походу готов. writers, artists, film experts and intellectuals. Behind a hectic facade of frivolity, Berlin was hiding its tragic decadence. During my short time there, I met some impressive people, like the filmmakers Fritz Lang and Walter Ruttmann, from whose film Symphony of a Great City these images come. Playwright Luigi Pirandello invited me to a restaurant where we had Sabaglioni. He wanted to use the new sound techniques to have characters on the screen argue with the projector. I visited Brecht, that tenacious intellectual who uses his pen like a drill to demolish the obstacles he cannot overcome with the fire of his passion. There was also Albert Einstein, whose theory of relativity I had already studied. He gave me a photograph signed, From Einstein to Eisenstein, which made me feel very honoured. The artist Georg Grosch confessed that he based his style on the graffiti found on lavatory walls. the same style as Grosch, I made my own drawings of Berlin nightlife, a frightening spectacle of refined perversion and every kind of sexual deviation. city, the brothels and transvestites. As I explored this underworld of sensuality, it raised once again the question of my own sexual identity.
Berlin forced me to reconsider my inhibitions towards women and my supposed latent homosexuality. I'd never felt that impulse, although I could not deny a somewhat abnormal sexuality, at least on the mental level, like Zola or Balzac. London. Here too, my film Potemkin was not allowed to be shown in public. The government apparently thought it too dangerous for the general audience. I took part in a filmmaking class taught by Hans Richter in a room near Foyle's bookshop. When I played a policeman, a classic English bobby, everyone was surprised and amused. I gave my lectures at the London Film Society and visited Cambridge University. I found the atmosphere polite and unenthusiastic. Everywhere, people and the press treated me with respect, very much in the English manner. I enjoyed visiting museums and libraries where I spent many interesting hours. Peter Kapitza invited me to the high table at Trinity College, where I was deeply impressed by the antiphonal reading of the Latin grace beneath those high arches, soaring into the gloom of Gothic naves. Years later, that evening at Trinity helped shape the scene around Anastasia's coffin in Ivan the Terrible. atmosphere of Cambridge was unforgettable and I found the strange customs and rituals of the university fascinating. From England my lecture tour took me to Holland which I naturally associated with Van Houten's chocolate pointed bonnets, and of course, wooden clogs. The first thing I said at my press conference in Rotterdam was, what's happened to the clogs? This innocent question immediately appeared as a newspaper headline. in Paris in November of 1929, full of excitement, remembering my childhood visit with my mother. Strolling through the city, I felt like a child left alone in an enchanted garden. I was soon to discover that my notoriety in France was exclusively due to the political content of my films. They claimed that my revolutionary cinema appealed only to intellectuals and socialist militants and not to the ordinary people. wanted to invest in films like mine. I made a pilgrimage to visit James Joyce, who played me a recording he'd made of part of Finnegan's Wake, which only confirmed how important his experiments with interior monologue could be for the cinema. Relations between France and the Soviet Union were not good. So, instead of showing my film, The Old and the New, I had to give a lecture at the Sorbonne. 
The university was surrounded by police, like a fortress, and although nothing happened, the threat of deportation hung over me. Jean Cocteau was highly sympathetic. He begged me to forgive France for my treatment by the authorities. Finally, after months of discussion, a contract with Paramount Pictures, and I set sail for America with my new boss, Mr. Lasky. skyscrapers of New York, which didn't seem as tall as I'd imagined. The city, especially at night, made my head spin. Never in my life had I seen so many people and cars, and the noise, I was stunned. I soon lost all sense of perspective and balance. a publicity campaign to launch me in America as an attractive and respectable director. Lasky gave me plenty of advice as we traveled to a Paramount convention in Atlantic City. Don't be too serious, but also don't frighten them by being too frivolous. Here we are at the convention. I honestly can't remember one word of what I said. I've always found it painful to speak in public. Things got worse when the old and the new were shown at the cameo in New York. The American press was outraged by my support for the collectivization of agriculture. forget meeting one of the cinema's greatest pioneers, D.W. Griffith, early one morning in the lobby of a Manhattan hotel. It was the 22nd of October 1930 and we recognized each other immediately from photographs. We shook hands but Griffith didn't want to discuss his films. Half of them are worthless, he said. I only did them so that I could make the few I really loved. Even Griffith had to fight for his films, like any beginner. At last, I left for Hollywood, where I hoped to go into production. With Paramount's salary, Tisse, Alexandrov, Montague and I lived in a house with a swimming pool in Beverly Hills. We even had a black cook and a DeSoto car. The first people I met in California was Walt Disney, whom I admired enormously. Through nothing more than drawing, he brings to life those marvelous characters, Willie the Whale and Mickey Mouse. Living in Hollywood was an entertaining experience. I used to run into Rin Tin Tin, Max Sennett, the queen of the peroxide blondes, Jean Harlow, Marlene Dietrich, and her director, Josef von Sternberg, who suffered from an inferiority complex because the film world looked down on him. On the set, he used to meditate for a long time, holding his head in his hands, although this didn't seem to serve any purpose. I saw him in a state of depression while he was making Morocco with Dietrich and Gary Cooper. The Divine Garbo, on the other hand, never allowed any visitors on the set. She found being an actress very hard work because she had no technique. She played everything by instinct, which meant that when she wasn't inspired, she would cry and have hysterics.
while I was waiting to have a project accepted, I saw a lot of my old friends, like Douglas Fairbanks, whom I'd met in Moscow along with his wife, Mary Pickford. America's sweetheart, I discovered, always carried a knife in her purse. Doug and Mary were, of course, very successful and had a business partnership with another of my friends, Charlie Chaplin. Chaplin had an extraordinary talent and real genius, but he was also a shrewd businessman. We spent many happy hours with him on his yacht and around his swimming pool, which was shaped like a bowler hat. He really enjoyed his huge success. Chaplin thought highly of me and introduced me to the novelist Upton Sinclair, who gave me the money to make a film in Mexico. Every project I put to Paramount was turned down, even Sutter's Gold and An American Tragedy, so I left Hollywood for Mexico. a whirlwind year in Mexico, but I can hardly bear to think about the grotesque misunderstandings which destroyed my friendship with Sinclair and my film Que Viva Mexico, leaving what I had shot to be mangled by others. Wrote. Movement is what attracts our attention. Only later do we think of the object that moved. It was in Mexico that I started drawing again, seeking expression in the movement of a restless, unbroken line. emissary and Bolshevik bandit, as the American press called me, had to return home. This was what everyone in Washington and Moscow wanted. During my absence, many things had changed in Moscow. I felt like a nobody. My only activity was teaching classes at the Institute of Cinematography. Because I'd been abroad, I was accused of a lack of social responsibility and of being interested only in my own ideas. It was like being put on trial. My script for a film about the history of Moscow was rejected. The message was obvious. I was supposed to engage in public self-criticism. In 1935, I started work on Begin Meadow, which was heavily criticized and then stopped. Eventually, I 
I was able to make Alexander Nevsky as a contribution to raising the popular consciousness of how Russia became a single nation. My subject was patriotism, but instead of the masses, I dealt with a single hero, Nevsky, the Prince of Novgorod, who defeated the Teutonic Knights in the 13th century. For this film and all my later projects, I made detailed drawings while writing the script. It was my first sound film, and in it, I tried to solve the problem of achieving a rhythmic correspondence between the images and Prokofiev's music. I finally received official recognition, the Order of Lenin, and the film was a popular success. Even the President of the United States, Roosevelt, asked to see the film at the White House. In 1941, the American Film Index listed which film personalities had been most written about in the history of cinema, and I came fourth after Chaplin, Griffith, and Mary Pickford. This is how far that little boy from Riga had come. Die Valkyra, which was staged at the Bolshoi in 1940 to mark the signing of the non-aggression pact between Germany and the Soviet Union. All that remains of it are photographs and drawings. to link the music and lighting, but the theatre's resources turned out to be so inadequate that my clumsy attempts to underline the opera's emotional structure only made audiences laugh. That disaster was instructive for me, but I never had another chance to direct an opera. Meanwhile, 
that the world war was imminent. And intellectuals like me, who were no longer young, could only fight Nazism and racism with the weapon of ideas. As a Russian representative of the Soviet intelligentsia, and working as I do in the sphere of Russian cinematography and Russian art, the very principle of racial hatred is foreign and loathsome to me. Basing itself on the principles of equal fraternal rights, on spiritual and material values for each nation, for each people, our country regards with indistinguished indignation any case of national oppression. But the time for call to indignation and condemnation has passed. The time has come to fight. In this sacred struggle, the Soviet Union is uniting all people who with sword in hand are ready to rise for the right to call themselves Czechs, Poles, Dutchmen, Belgians, Russians, or Jews. Because it is not only a matter of saving a nation that has given humanity great voice, thinkers, and artists. Because it is not only a matter of saving a people numbering many millions of human lives, but because it is a matter of triumph of humanism over brutality, barbarism, infamy, and violence because it is a matter of bright future for all humanity, irrespective of nationality. Throughout the war, I continued drawing, especially when filming was impossible. Those drawings, how I hoarded them lovingly, like an archivist, hoping for some future discovery. I remember that even the New York Times once showed an interest in them. This is my last drawing, L'Après-Midi d'un Phone. The great historical fresco of Ivan the Terrible was my last film. Its theme was the demands of power exercised on behalf of the people, and its aesthetic references come from the pictorial and melodramatic tradition of the 18th century. My contemporary, Sergei Yutkevich, has written that it takes us back to an understanding of cinema as a powerful visual art. As he says, the musical dimension cannot be divorced from the visual in what is a truly symphonic film. It was for Ivan that I drew my most detailed graphic treatment. In these sketches, I anticipated every detail of the framing of shots, the visual effects, and the actor's gestures. part of Ivan, which was finished in October 1944, I received our highest award, the Stalin Prize. Sergei Prokofiev was again my valued collaborator. ready to tackle the last adversary, colour, which, although not strictly necessary, had long been beckoning me. It was only in 
this second part of Ivan the Terrible, which came in for severe criticism from the central authority of the party, that I could use colour film for the first time. And it was then I realised that colour does not stem from the cinematic material, but from the inner structure of the story, whether this is lyrical, epic or dramatic. On of February 1948, I abandoned forever my films, my books, and my drawings. Has it really been a life? Yes, it has been a life of joy, torment, and excitement, and I can't imagine wanting to exchange it for any other.